Well, I'm excited to start a new study tonight, and it's entitled Letters from Paul. Paul wrote two epistles or letters, and they are 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Um, it's interesting that we had no record that Paul traveled, I'm sorry, that Peter, we have no record that Peter traveled throughout Asia Minor, which is now Turkey. But he wrote this letter and designated it to uh, the churches of Turkey. It's interesting that uh, there are different types of letters written in the New Testament. Some of the letters uh, were written to just one congregation, one church, one group. And some of the letters of Paul are like that. For instance, the letter that he wrote to Romans the letter he wrote to the Corinthians, the church at Corinth, and there were others that were to a single church, a single group of believers that were having questions or issues or just needed encouragement. So those letters went to one church. Other letters went to a group of churches, such as the book of Revelation. It was addressed to seven churches in Asia Minor. Well, these two letters that were written by Peter are called general epistles because they were written for any and all believers throughout the general church. And they started by being circulated throughout Turkey, uh, what is today Turkey. Back in those days, it was Asia Minor, and it was split into several regions or districts. and. Um, Peter names them in uh, verse in the, the first verses of the epistle. It's interesting that we're not exactly sure when uh, the first book of Peter was written, but we think it was in the year uh, 66 A.D. That would have been 35 years after Christ's death and resurrection and ascension. So Peter was alive and ministering and working for 35 years. He was already an older man at the time he was with Jesus. In fact, he was considered the, the oldest of the disciples, but he lived another 35 years and worked and ministered during those years. And it appears that he went to Rome in his last year or two. So these letters, of uh, Peter's that were written to Asia Minor may have been written in Rome. And he was there at the time of um, Paul. Paul was in Rome. He was in uh, prison and then house arrest uh, during this time that Peter was there. This time period, AD 64, AD 65, and 66, the time period when these two letters were written, was the time when Emperor Nero was just uh, beginning his reign. He was the emperor that brought such terrible persecution on the Christians. Well, let's begin by reading verse 1. Do we have a volunteer who would like to read verse 1, please? Pastor, Did everybody uh, volunteer at once? Who is that? You no, know, I was just asking, which book are you reading from? Uh, um, the, the first epistle of Peter. First Peter. Peter. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Who would like to read verse 1? I will. Please, Peter, an apostle, <clears throat> Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, to the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace. Okay. Go ahead. And peace be with you in abundance. All right. Thank you. Thank you for reading those uh, two verses of reading. Now let's. Um, Let's take a look at um, some of the words and ideas in this uh, 
two verse reading that Peter gives. Uh, first of all, he identifies himself. Peter, some people think that Peter didn't write these two epistles because they said that the writing is too scholarly and Peter just wasn't that scholarly. But after 35 years being with Jesus, couldn't Peter be changed? If, if Peter's writing was inspired by the Holy Spirit, do you think the Holy Spirit is going to inspire unintelligent writing or intelligent writing? And so three, there are many 3.5 years? Are, oh, Pastor, yeah. was it 3.5 years or 35 years? 35 years. Oh. He, Peter was ministering 35 years after Jesus went back to heaven. And, yes. uh, and then there's the other point, too, that, that uh, Peter, in one uh, verse that we'll read in the future, Peter had a, uh, a scribe, and the scribe may have polished the writing a little bit. The scribe may have uh, made it sound a little more uh, educated and uh, intelligent. But um, that should not be uh, a detraction from the authorship uh, just because his letter to uh, these two letters, First Peter and Second Peter, were well written should not make us think that Peter did not write them when it says right here in verse one that Peter is the one that uh, these letters are from. Peter, uh, and he's, he gives his, his position, his title, an apostle, an apostle. He's not bragging. He's not lifting himself up. Uh, he's just stating that he was a missionary, a, mes a messenger, uh, an apostle, a servant of Jesus Christ, it says. And um, it's interesting that he names Jesus as Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus Christ, these two names designate both the Lord's humanity and his official capacity as uh, the anointed one. So Jesus was the Christ, the anointed one, and yet he was Jesus, a uh, human, Jesus, the son of Mary and, uh, and Joseph. So, um, we accept generally that um, Peter wrote these two epistles as letters to be shared by all the churches in Asia Minor. And so it, it was a circular letter. These were two circular letters that were to be read by one church and then sent to the next church and then forwarded to another and another until they all had a chance to read. It's, it's interesting that um, uh, it says in verse 2 that um, something about foreknowledge. It says, uh, the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you. So let's talk a little bit about the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. What does that mean, the elect? Pastor, uh, can, Pastor yes. can, I, can I back up and, and remind yes. us yes. that um, Ellen White only had a third grade education. I know she had secretaries and helpers too, but she only had a third grade education, and that's probably equivalent to Peter. Yeah, and... Did Ellen White write uh, intelligently or, or not? Yes. Her writing is absolutely beautiful. Ellen White's writing is so uh, just, it, it's, it's wonderful writing. And it must be that, uh, that part of the inspiration God gave her was the inspiration to write beautifully and um, intelligent and so if he did it for Ellen White God could do it for Peter as well absolutely thanks for sharing that Dale. for for Ellen White um, you know she wanted to be a scholar and then she had the unfortunate accident where she got hit with a rock 
but she had aspirations of getting a lot of education, but it was cut short because of getting hit, hit with a rock from a, a, another student. That's true. That's true. Thank you for sharing that. So what does it mean, the elect? Um, the elect according to the foreknowledge. The elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father. Well, what he's saying is God knew ahead of time that Peter would be an apostle for him, a missionary, a messenger for him. Uh, God knew ahead of time that he would call Peter to the work of apostleship, to the work of a messenger, a missionary. and. Um, God knew ahead of time that he would send uh, Peter as a missionary throughout these churches in Asia Minor. He was the elect, according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father. So um, is it God the Father that has the foreknowledge, or is it Jesus Christ, or is it both? Probably both. Hmm? Pardon? Well, it says in here, the Father. It says here, the Father. In this case, uh, the Father. But doesn't the, uh, doesn't the Father know all things, and doesn't he give uh, knowledge to Jesus, his Son? Yes. Well, well, when Jesus was on the earth, he says, um, Jesus says, no man knoweth the um, hour of his return, um, except for the Father, which is in heaven. So that was at that time. So there is, there are some things that either Jesus limited himself to, or, you know, what whatnot. Right? He, he treated everyone. He tried to save everybody. He didn't. He wasn't thinking like, okay, this person's not going to be saved, right? Right. But, but the Father revealed to him what the Father was going to reveal to him. It's it's through the Father that he had this revelation that. Uh, Father and the Holy Spirit. Yes, and uh, going back to your point, Tom, it's um, it's widely believed that Jesus didn't know the day nor the hour of his second coming uh, when he was here on earth. But now that he's in heaven, he right. must know. Yeah, he must. He might. He must know. Yeah, I've, I've mentioned that before. But the elect, accord, according to the foreknowledge of the Father. It just yes. it doesn't say the it doesn't say that Jesus wasn't around looking at people to see whether they were elect or not. He he would just go about doing things to help people, right? No, and it's true. He, uh, Peter doesn't specify here what God the Father knows and what God the Son knows, or what God the Father does and what God the Son does, or what God the Holy Spirit does. He's not addressing that here. He just says. And he was the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And then he goes on to say, through sanctification of the Spirit. Isn't that interesting that one of the primary functions of the Holy Spirit is your sanctification and my sanctification? And what is sanctification? It is making us holy, making us Christ-like. Uh, perfecting our character. It is um, the work of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? It, it's, it says this in Scripture over and over, and yet we're so prone to miss it. But it says in verse 2, uh, the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. We don't work our own sanctification. Our sanctification is worked through the power of the Spirit. We couldn't be sanctified on our own. It is only through the Holy Spirit and through God that we were sanctified. Isn't that powerful? And so we're reminded again that it's God's work, not ours. And it goes on to say, um, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood unto obedience. I want to share something. Um, um, I want to 
want to share something uh, here, by the way, from uh, the commentaries. It says uh, about obedience, um, A, the Christian's faithful response to the call of God is obedience, or B, uh, together with the sanctifying activity of the Holy Spirit, leads to obedience, which may be defined as perfect submission, the will of God. And so they give two possible definitions here in the commentary for obedience. One is the Christian's faithful response to the call of God in our lives. And two, uh, perfect submission to the will of God. That's interesting. I, I don't remember reading that before. But um, that, that's um, an interesting way to understand sanctification. By the way, I'd also like to share with you uh, some thoughts from the commentary about uh, the foreknowledge of God. Uh, it says, although the exact nature and work of each member of the Godhead um, remain a mystery to man, Peter seems to suggest that within the economy of the plan of salvation, certain specific functions are performed by each member of the Godhead. Isn't that interesting? Fascinating. And so um, we don't know fully and completely the function of each member of the Godhead. It's a mystery to us. Even the prophets and the writers of Scripture didn't fully understand the function of each member of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was a mystery to them, and it remains a mystery to man today. But Peter seems to suggest that within the economy of the plan of salvation, certain specific functions are performed by each member of the Godhead. That's fascinating to me. Well, let's go on um, with verse 2, and it says, with the sprinkling of the blood, the sprinkling of the blood. What, what is this talking about? Would someone care to explain or elaborate this phrase? It says that uh, he, he, Peter, was uh, one of the elect, according to the foreknowledge of God, through sanctification of the Spirit, uh, to the obedience of sprinkling of blood. What is he talking about there? What does he mean through the sprinkling of blood? Uh, obedience and sprinkling of blood. Well, it sounds like a, 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 some sort of reference to something that a priest would do. Right in that sanctuary. Okay. Who does the sprinkling of the blood? The priest, or is it the high priest? Yes, Jesus. it was the priest in the daily sanctuary. It's interesting. Peter understood the functions of the of the sanctuary. Uh, all the New Testament writers were very familiar with the functions of the temple and the sanctuary. And one of the functions, as you said, was for the priest in the daily services to sprinkle the blood, but also on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would sprinkle the blood. They would sprinkle it on the, on the curtain, they would sprinkle it on the horns of the altar, they would sprinkle it on the mercy seat in the, um, in the uh, most holy place uh, on the Day of Atonement. But what's represented by the sprinkling of blood? What's, what's, what's important about it anyway? You know, I've been to temples in Asia where blood was sprinkled all over the steps and blood was sprinkled on the idols and blood was sprinkled uh, all over in the... Uh, in the temple where their gods were. Um, it's interesting that they do that as sort of in a similar way to the, the Jewish 
sprinkling of blood in their sanctuary, but a totally different meaning. The sprinkling of the blood is all about applying the merits of Jesus, our Redeemer. Jesus was the Lamb, and when he was sacrificed, uh, when the Lamb was sacrificed, some of the blood was taken in a little basin and was sprinkled uh, on the altar, on the horns of the altar, before the veil that led into the holy place, before the veil that led into the most holy place, and then on the Day of Atonement, on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And it was a way of applying the merits of Jesus, applying the perfection of Jesus in place of our imperfection. Uh, it was a means of, um, of uh, claiming Jesus' righteousness in place of our unrighteousness and his blood uh, saving us. Um, it's, it's a powerful experience. And Peter refers to it here as uh, part of the function of God, God the Father, who uh, does the work of sanctification through the Spirit and obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so uh, without the sprinkling of blood, without the shedding of blood of Jesus on the cross, we would not have salvation. We would not uh, have obedience and sanctification we would not have salvation. And so um, he ends verse two by saying, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Do you have any questions or thoughts about the sprinkling of blood? I'd like to hear more about that. Well, Jesus' blood is our lifeline actually. Yes. It, it represents life. The blood, the life is in the blood, and he uh, gives us rebirth with that. Absolutely. Isn't there a text that says, without the shedding of blood? What does it say? Hebrews 9.22, there is no remission of sin. No remission of sin. Yes. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Tom wrote that in the chat room, by the way. I'm sorry? Tom put that in the chat room. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Great. And so... Um, can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Barry. Go ahead. Because um, we, keep, we keep getting muted about 10 times. Um, I was thinking of looking at Hebrews 10.22. Oh, let's do that. Hebrews 10, 22. Yeah, it says, um, are we there? Just about. Okay, I'm here. Okay, it says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Oh, that's beautiful. With our hearts sprinkled. And it's referring to the blood. The blood and of that's, that, yeah, that reveal, that's uh, referring more to uh, what the sprinkling of blood means today for, for Christians. Um, and that uh, today, of course, uh, the faith of Jesus' blood and the water of baptism consecrates our believers so that they can draw near and perform a spiritual ministry of praise, good works, and thanksgiving before God. So it sounds like this sprinkling is very important. Absolutely. And what were you reading from? Uh, that was from uh, the commentary in the Andrew Study Bible. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. And um, so 
notice in the verse that uh, Barry directed us to, Hebrews 10, 22, it says, um, with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So our hearts are sprinkled clean. We don't normally think of sprinkling blood to produce cleansing, do we? In fact, uh, in emergency rooms, they're very careful and quick to clean up the blood um, and to protect from contact with with blood. And and uh, and here it's it's sprinkled to produce a cleansing. It is Christ's blood that cleanses us from sin. It is Christ's blood that purifies us and justifies us and gives us salvation. Um, are there any other comments? Yeah, that's an interesting verse. Uh, thank you, Barry. Um, and and what it says in here, okay, it doesn't mention blood, right? Uh, no, but, but it does say having your is the implication there that it would be blood having your having our hearts sprinkled, but that but just the thought I I I don't know what to make of this sprinkled from an evil conscience. Um, what okay, what could be evil about a conscience? I I have a thought that what what might be evil about a conscience, but what what do you think that could mean? Um, Here we hear Caroline and and Barry. Uh, you remember what I said about ten minutes ago that Peter understood the sanctuary service and the meaning right. of sprinkling of blood. In fact, all yeah. the New Testament writers understood it. They, they had experience firsthand with the sanctuary, sanctuary and its services. So the sprinkling of blood referred to what we just described. Well, when it says sprinkled, we can assume it was blood. That's what you're saying? Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay, all right. You had another question, Tom? Yeah. yeah. Tom? When, okay. Yeah. So this is an interesting scripture. So when is a conscience evil? What would make a conscience evil? Well, remember the Bible says that uh, uh, regarding a certain group of people that their conscience seared. was seared. Yes, yeah, seared conscience. In other words, yes. burned, deadened. When you sear something, it, it's deadened. Okay, so this is, that's right. I, I agree. Okay, so that makes sense. So having our... Um, if we're getting our heart sprinkled, a clean, you know, something's happening with our heart, and then somehow that's having, that's offsetting a seared conscience or not being convicted of sin or something like this. Yeah, you know, when they, in the Bible, when they speak of your, your heart, usually they're speaking about your mind. And that's where your conscience works, is in your mind. Oh, that's a good point, Galen. Excellent. Yeah, And so when we read about searching hearts, uh, and we read uh, where David said, search me, uh, and he was referring to his heart, that, that actually meant mind. It has to do with searching our minds. It says, let us draw near... Is there a difference, Barry, between our mind and our hearts? It says in here, let us draw near with a true heart. So the, so the initial condition is, um, or the, what we're, the action is we're drawing near, let us collectively, let us all draw near with a true heart. With a sincere heart, right? In sincerity? Yeah, yeah. Okay, full assurance of faith, right? Having faith, it's an essential part of the armor of God, right? Yes. And then having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Um, so basically, a re, a re, re, um, reawakening of a conscience that was that's evil or seared or something. Well, well, what our is our is conscience? Water, water baptism. Yeah. Yeah. What is our conscience? Well, it's, well, we know that the well, we we I don't I mean the the it's the well there's the holy the job of the Holy Spirit is the still small voice that says. This is the way you walk ye in it. So it's our um, moral compass. Moral compass, yes. It, it's, it's the voice of the Holy Spirit directing us, leading okay. us. Barry, sure. do you want to talk about um, 
uh, conscience, or do you want to talk about uh, uh, our heart versus our mind? Are we on? Yes, you're on. Okay. Uh, I think Galen is right. The heart and the mind are pretty much the same thing. Okay. Uh, any thought about the conscience? Well, isn't the conscience uh, the voice of God? I like that. Excellent. You know, many times people think of the heart is emotion also, and sometimes that gets in the way or involved. Very good point. Very good. So I want to um, just share a note here from the uh, Bible commentary about the sprinkling, and then we'll move on to verse 3. It says, the application of the merits of Christ's blood to the individual, the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus, brings peace and justification, as well as the privileges of the new covenant. Isn't that great? So the yeah. sprinkling of the blood not only brings justification and peace, but it brings the privileges of the new covenant. That's powerful. Would you mind, would you mind telling us what, what the privileges of the new covenant are? All right, let's go to that. Let's look at Matthew 26, 28. Matthew 26, 28. Does someone have it? Would you like to read that, please? Matthew 26, 28. For yes. this is my blood, for this is my blood of the new, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Okay, in my version it says, for this is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so the, the new covenant was the, uh, the uh, uh, assurance of salvation through Jesus. Uh, it was... Uh, the old covenant was um, misunderstood by the people to to be their work. The new covenant is um, the work of Jesus in our life. All right, let's have a volunteer read verse three, please. First Peter chapter one, verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Thank you. So um, what does this mean? Which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us. What does that mean? God through his mercy has begotten us. Well, in the Bible, especially the Old Testament, the word begotten was often used to mean birth. And so this is referring to the new birth. We're born again through the Holy Spirit. We're born again through Jesus and his blood. We have new life. We have um, a, a new being. We are new creatures in Christ. And so we could read it this way, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has given us a new birth. Again, unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's because of his resurrection that we have new life. It is it was promised before his resurrection and before his death, but it was his actual resurrection that gives us that, uh, that through his resurrection that we have the new birth and new life in Christ. Any comments or thoughts? 
You know, John 3.16 uses the word begotten, and that's uh, being born. And with, with us, it's like being reborn. Okay. That's absolutely true. An excellent example of what we we're just talking about. Um, begotten, being born again. And um, John 3.16 was in that chapter of John chapter 3. About what? What was that chapter about? The visit of Jesus with Nicodemus and telling Nicodemus he must be born again. And um, let's go to verse 4, shall we? Uh, who would like to read verse 4? Two. Oh, okay, go ahead. thank you, Mary. Okay, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Oh, this is such a powerful verse. Um, what is an inheritance? It is the benefits and blessings of the Father given to the Son. Does the Son earn it? No. It is a gift given to the Son, and it's incorruptible. This inheritance that, the, that is given to us is free, and it's incorruptible. What Peter is talking about is the spiritual inheritance that is given through the blood of Jesus and his resurrection. It's free. It's a free inheritance, and it's incorruptible. What does it mean, incorruptible? What does incorruptible mean? It, it doesn't uh, dissipate or, or, or go away with time, right? No, it's not tainted. Not tainted? Yeah. It is not subject to decay or dissolution or deterioration. It is eternal. Listen, our inheritance is eternal. Nothing can diminish it or dissolve it or deteriorate it. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, fate is not away. Pardon? Fate is not away. And fate is not away. Yes. Dead. It's undefiled. It's incapable of pollution or defilement, and it fades not. Now, it's interesting that the Greek word uh, that was used here for not fade, that uh, this inheritance doesn't fade, the Greek word is amaranthos, amaranthos, which is where we get the name of the flower, the amaranth. It's a name of an imaginary unfading flower, and it's, um, it's, it's imaginary, but people have often wanted to, to have flowers that don't fade. When I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro in, in Kenya, um, it's interesting that everyone who reached the summit, everyone who made it to the top, I was in a group of 22, and there were four of us, only four that made it to the top. It's almost 20,000 feet. It's 19,927 feet high. Uh, it's a very difficult climb. And those of us that made it to the top, when we got to the bottom, they made wreaths for us out of everlasting flowers. Do you know I still have them? It's been 50 years, and those dried flowers still have their color. It's amazing. Those flowers grow on Mount Kilimanjaro in the volcanic ash of that mountain. And it's a very unique kind of flower, very special flower that holds its color, doesn't fade. And what a powerful lesson that is about the salvation that is given to us by Jesus. It is our inheritance. It is incorruptible. It doesn't fade. Isn't that powerful? And, uh, and it also says in verse, uh, in verse 3, it says uh, this, oh, I love this phrase. 
it said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Christ Jesus. Lively hope. We have this lively hope. Um, it, this lively hope could also be translated as living hope. You know, the rest of the world doesn't have that hope. Many people are stressed right now because of the, the pandemic and the impact it's having economically and the impact it's having on their families. Many people are stressed and agonizing, but Christians can have living hope. This hope is the great force that continually beckons the Christian forward in conquering life's problems. Without Christ, there is no hope. With him, hope is living and dynamic. Heathenism can offer only empty delusions. Peter here speaks of the inward subjective hope that holds a man steadfast as he contemplates the end of the Christian journey and the eternal future. So powerful, the words of Peter, of the hope, the living hope, the lively hope that we have as Christians because of the blood of Jesus. It's because of the blood of Jesus sprinkled on our hearts that we have this hope and this peace in Jesus. And so uh, we have this inheritance. You know, Pastor, yes. that, that reminds me of the song by Hooper, you know, uh, one of the heralds, we have this hope. Oh, That's yes. kind of our mantra. It is. It's, it's the Adventist anthem. It's the Adventist anthem. Yes, we have this hope. And the hope is in the second coming of Jesus. It's in um, the... Uh, the life that is promised to us because of the blood of Jesus. Well, um, notice also in verse four that it says reserved, uh, reserved in heaven for you, reserved. The inheritance of the redeemed is as certain as the faithfulness of God. Listen, listen, our hope, our salvation, is reserved in heaven. It, it's mm -hmm. there. We can count on it. It's waiting for us like a reserved table at your favorite restaurant. Right. The inheritance of the redeemed is as certain as the faithfulness of God. It's already in the bank. It's already in the bank. And uh, let's have someone read verse 5, shall we? Who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Okay, read the first part of that verse again, would you please, Tots? Who are kept, what is it, what did you read? Who through faith are shielded by God's power who by until faith the coming are, of the Who by faith are what? Shielded. Okay. Shielded. Faith are shielded by God's power That's until it. the coming of the salvation that is All really right. to be revealed in the last time. Thank you. My translation says, um, who are kept by the power of God. And yours says shielded. Those who are shielded by the power of God or kept. Listen to this. This is interesting. The Greek word for kept or shielded is a military term indicating the protection provided by a whole garrison of troops. So this is saying that our hope, our hope of heaven, our hope of salvation is kept like a garrison of troops uh, protecting uh, their watch. Isn't that powerful? 
-hmm. Yeah, it sounds like um, it. It sounds like um, who 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 are kept? The people that are. Um, it's the people that are being kept, right? The, the ones that are washed in Christ's blood. The well, ones yes, that are his. Yes. Right. The ones who have hope. They are kept. Yes. They are preserved. Like soldiers guarding their well, so, watch. Well, yeah, they're well, guarding them. They're, they're guarding them. The soldier, if you're, what you're, that was a good point you made. The sol, if that's the case, then the soldiers are guarding the people. The people of God. Absolutely. Absolutely. Did someone else have a comment? Well, I oh, just I say we, we have more than a garrison protecting us. Oh, that's good. Dale. Amen. Yeah. Yes. Amen. Yeah. I want to read two paragraphs from the commentary here about the power of God. In verse 5, it says, uh, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. It says regarding the power of God, the safety of the saints, the successful conquest of personal sin uh, depends on the power of the infinite God doing for man what he cannot accomplish for himself. Without the constant protection and guidance of God, Christians will never personally realize the inheritance now guarded by God and the redeemed, for the redeemed. Literally, by means of faith, through faith, that which makes possible the enclosure of the saints within the protective care of the omnipotence is the individual faith of each believer. That which makes it possible for the saints within the protective care of omnipotence is the individual faith of each believer. God can do, God can do little for the man who refuses to believe. Faith trusts God and is confident that his way of life will fully satisfy the deepest yearnings of the human soul. Isn't that powerful? Yes, especially interesting <laughs> about applying that in today's, in today's age. It doesn't seem like, uh, yeah, thinking about that would be good to think about some more. Sure. Thank you for that. Yeah, it says ready to re be revealed in the last time. That oh. could be for our age. I didn't see. Yes. Okay. And so uh, the deliverance is ready for him or her and awaits only the wisdom of God as the time of its actual reception. Yeah. At the end of verse 5, it mentions... How does it put it? The last time. It says, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. What is the last time? Well, we hope it's the time we're in. We hope it's our time now. It's the time of the second coming. That's the last time. All right, okay. let's go ahead and have a season of prayer. Who would like to pray about the things we've read and studied tonight? Who would like to be first? Did you hear that? Who would like to pray first? Father, we, um, we've uh, been struggling with some pretty deep passages here. And Lord, we're, um, we're thankful that... Uh, that our salvation is based on Jesus' resurrection. And Lord, we, um, we are just thankful that Jesus loved us enough to leave all heaven, come to this world, be rejected by his own uh, creation, yet still die for the sins of the world. My, what a God you are. 
and we just want to praise you this evening. And Lord, as we realize that um, that our faith is based, our, I mean, our our salvation is based on your resurrection. That gives us much peace and assurance because we believe that you died for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your mercy, for the hope that you've given us, for the blood that you've shed for us. And studying this, these verses gives us, as Barry said, assurance that you are, you have a plan for us that can only be lost if we turn away. Lord, may we face you and and love you and spend eternity with you because that's where you want us and that's where we want to be lord keep us faithful give us strength and courage for the upcoming time until you come and we have this hope that you will come soon and we say even even so lord jesus come soon because we want to see you we want to see you quickly be with us in the meantime, we thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. 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 Is there is there another? Lord, thank you for this inheritance that we have, um, that you put aside, that you promised and given us this hope. I'm sure these things were just said. And, I, um, and uh, just, just thank you for this. The little tokens of hope that you give us, that you put down through us, especially sprinkled within your word here, the, the, the writings passed down through many generations and preserved by you. Thank you, God, for this hope. And uh, may we have this hope, and may may others in this in this time of uncertainty and belief in evolution and 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 you know progressiveness for a way in the future and all these different ideas, Lord. May all these may all all these people be silent and know that you are God and recognize mm -hmm. and may they find this hope also and to, not just to be a a made up or some make believe thing, but the Lord help us help them help them and help us to see this as a reality. We ask this in Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Thank you, Father. Father. Go ahead, please. Okay, Father in heaven. Thank you that you have continued all these thousands of years. Oh, powerful gospel promise that you would be faithful, a faithful high priest. You would not die with the old priesthood, but you would continue on, and that it would be your greatest joy to receive. And Lord, these days with the darkness coming upon the earth, and gross, gross darkness of people and ourselves even lord we especially especially today these days we need your help we need you to prompt us and, and uh, spur us to come back to you to stay with you to keep these things that are not not some legend from the distant past that are still present that you have still promised them that you haven't ceased that that you are coming again soon and that we need to be ready for you and and be ready to say this is our god we've waited for him lord bring all this powerful gospel back to life lord Amen. In early rain, Lord, especially in preparation for the latter rain. In amen. Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father, for being with us tonight. Thank you for being with us in prayer and listening to our prayers. Thank you for teaching us and reminding us again of the blessed hope we have in the blood of Jesus. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.